So the, 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 this last, we have three last speakers, which is actually among, if, if you can't pay for any of this stuff, it doesn't happen. And the, whether investors feel good, bad, or indifferent to over the top of telecom and the way things are going is, is very important. Policymakers can have the most wonderful ideas in the world, but if, it if somebody isn't going to pay for it, it won't happen. So, with that, no further ado, I'd like to talk, uh, first introduce Craig Moffat. Craig was quoted this morning, I guess, by uh, Simon Wilkie as, uh, I guess, a purveyor of doom. <laughs> I mean, Simon was in his black mood because of Craig's analysis, so tell us all about it, Craig. Um, so let me start uh, with, with um, playing my role of purveyor of doom for a second. Um, this is actually, let's skip ahead to this one for a second. These are, this is the US, right? So we're talking about the richest um, country in the world, the country that presumably would be best able to support all of this. And what we're looking at here is return on invested capital uh, for the subsectors of the broader telecom space. So uh, wireless, wireline, cable, and satellite. Um, starting on the left there, returns in the wireline sector, um, I show only Verizon and AT&T here, um, CenturyLink, Frontier, and, and Windstream would be worse. Um, but Verizon and AT&T uh, are very poor returns, um, sub 10% returns. Verizon not coming close to earning its cost of capital in its wireline sector. Um, after having spent a tremendous amount of money building a fiber uh, network, its return on invested capital for the entire wireline business is now less than 2%. Its cost of capital again, is north of 7 um, We'll look at these on a net basis relative to their cost of capital in just a second. Wireless is better. I think one of the other things that's interesting about the wireless category, uh, the second to the left there, is that there's actually a bit of dispersion there among the four, the, the, the four players. In all the other categories, the dispersion is extremely low, which I think tells you that it's the industry, not the company. Um, it's either a good business or a bad business, and whether the companies or the operators have better management, less management, what have you, doesn't really make much difference. Uh, so in, in wireless, you have a couple of com companies earning passable returns, um, others earning poor returns. We'll look at the, uh, the, the, the wireline wireless in aggregate in a minute because I think that's the right way to look at them. Um, the regional wireless operators, sorry that the dots are so light, but they're earning lousy returns. Um, the cable industry is actually earning very good returns now, um, and I'll come back to them in a minute. They are the sector, interestingly, that is most often cited as um, the one subject to the greatest risk from over the top. I would argue they have the least risk from over the top. Uh, and that the wireline and wireless or the wireless operators actually have the greatest risk of over the top. Uh, and then satellite, I won't spend a lot of time on. The, the returns in that business are exceptionally high. The real question is how sustainable are they? And they're a little bit outside of our um, core discussion uh, as, they, as, as much as they don't participate in the broadband business. Now let's put the companies together for a second and look at them on an individual company basis. And this is this differs from the previous chart in that this is relative to the cost of capital. So this is simply return um, plus or minus the cost of, uh, minus the cost of capital. So a positive number means it's earning above its cost of capital. A negative number means it is not. Interestingly, the entire telecommunications industry in the United States does not earn its cost of capital. Um, that's a striking observation. And, and let me be clear, this is the most positive an optimistic view of the cost of capital and the, the return of the cost of capital you could possibly have. This ignores the cost of what they actually paid for the assets, that is, there's no goodwill included in this calculation, and it ignores anything that they decide to count as extraordinary items, including headcount reductions, for example, that they have taken every year for 13 years and called extraordinary every time. Um, if you looked at these businesses through a more sober lens, it wouldn't even be close. Every single telecommunications company would be destroying a tremendous amount of, of economic value. This is as good as it gets, folks, because this is the richest country in the world looking at the returns that they're getting on the network investments that they've made. They are not earning their cost of capital. And if you look forward a few years, think about the wireless business for a second. Looking forward a few years, you're talking about, if you believe Cisco's um, estimates, you're looking at 74% compound annual growth in volumes over the next five years. So you're looking at something like an 18-fold increase in the traffic on the network in five years. Uh, and 
obviously you're looking at nothing remotely like an 18 fold increase in, in revenues. The growth rate of the US telecommunications business, let's use Verizon and AT&T for a minute, taking out what they collect in, in the upfront charges for phones, which are sold at a loss, and just looking at what they actually do, which is as service providers, service revenue growth at Verizon and AT&T at the peak moment of, of wireless growth in the United States is sub 2% for both companies. Um, they are growing revenues at about 1.5% growth rates. Uh, that is on a consolidated basis. The U.S. wireless business, by the way, obviously the growth engine of the telecommunications sector. Subscriber growth in the, in the contract wireless business, which is the core of what the large wireless operators do. Subscriber growth, does anybody want to take a guess at what is the subscriber growth rate if you include all devices? So everything from smartphones, tablets, to wireless dog collars. Contract subscriber growth in the United States, who wants to take a wild guess? Minus two. It is positive one, it's positive one percent. If you just take primary devices, so the smartphones, feature phones, and, uh, and the like, the, pr the growth rate of the US postpaid wireless industry is negative one-tenth of one percent. So there's no growth anymore in, in subscriptions. Uh, ARPU growth is where it's all coming from. ARPU growth is obviously radically below the growth rate of usage, so you're seeing tremendous deflation and you're seeing deteriorating returns. This is what's happening in the broadband business. Uh, this is, cable is the top line, a, a bit tough to see there. Sorry, it's, a, it's, it's because of the light color. The green line is telecom. This is including all of the telecom investments in fiber. Even with that, the flow share, that is the share of growth in the market, is now essentially all going to the cable industry. Uh, as it, and Now remember, I think I have another slide on it here, I do. Uh, this is DSL. Uh, DSL was offsetting the, the access line losses through most of the left-hand side of this chart for a long time. Now DSL is actually compounding the access line losses in the United States. So the telcos have a real problem on their hands in the wireline business. Uh, this is where we project it going forward, where it goes from, uh, where DSL goes negative enough that it actually offsets more than all of the growth in fiber, uh, and the telcos become negative on a broadband basis even including their fiber investments. Uh, and this is what happens to margins when, uh, when you are losing share. This is the margins uh, since the beginning of 2007, so over a five-year period uh, for Verizon and for AT&T. Verizon started with margins up around 35% in the wireline business. Uh, they've now dropped to the low 30s. Um, when I first published uh, these margins, they said they were going to go into the high 30s. Uh, they, sorry, that's uh, at and I mean, at the top. Uh, Verizon started at 28, and they said they were going to go to the mid-30s. They went from 28 to 23. Uh, you can't grow margins in a business where you have high fixed costs and falling volumes. It just doesn't work. Uh, this is what's happened to their the, the fiber businesses. This is Verizon Fios. Uh, the chart on the left is, uh, is the net additions. You, the, the dark shaded bars are what's already happened. The light ones are our forecast. Essentially, the growth rate of that platform is already passed, um, and now you are into the maturation phase of that platform. The growth rate is the, is the dotted line uh, on the right-hand chart, and this, the number of subscribers is the, is the columns. Same thing for AT&T. You are past the real growth phase for that business in their Uverse platform, uh, and so those businesses are now falling back to earth. Um, and then this is the last place. I just this is a bit apropos of nothing. It's it's, it's but it's relevant to um, to OTT. Um, the left hand chart, and it's probably hard for you to see in the background in, in the back of the room there. But the left hand chart is the video business as we think of it today. This is just uh, the cable. Think of this as the cable video business. Uh, you have cost of goods sold. That is what a Comcast or a, or a Time Warner cable pays to Viacom and Disney and what have you you have about $30. And then you have revenue per month in the US video business of about $80. That leads most people to conclude that the gap between those two things, and people like me perpetuate that event by calling it margin, video margin. Um, the video margin in this case is $50. And there's, there's lots of hand-wringing about the fact that video margin um, in percentage terms is, is declining because programming costs are rising so quickly. But this is the reason that people like Netflix point to and say, look, we can come up with a better mousetrap because even if we have to pay more for the content, we can pay more than $30 for the content, uh, but we can still sell it for far less than 80 
because we don't need to earn that 50. We don't need to earn a return on the, on the, on the, the infrastructure. The problem with that is the $50 on the right-hand side is not margin. The $50 is actually transport. Um, and the cable operators are going to charge for transport regardless of, of who delivers and who buys the video. So frankly, if you think about the business this way, and I actually show it as a, as a thought experiment, the cable operators probably ought to only report the transport function as revenues and think of the, the, the cost of goods sold as not even part of revenues. Um, simply as a, as a collection, almost the way you think about tax collection, sales tax say, um, as a pass-through on behalf of customers. If you did that and you said, I'm reporting only the, the, the transport function as my revenue, my revenues would go down, my costs would go down, there would be no impact whatsoever on my profits. Um, and so I would end up with essentially exactly the same business, but with a, a slightly transformed income statement. I bet people would actually trade them at higher multiples. They'd be a better business because people would no longer um, misconstrue this business to believe that this is a highly vulnerable business to, um, to over the top. It is not. The cable operators are the only real infrastructure in the U.S. that could provide um, the kinds of services we're talking about, and one way or the other, they will charge for transport. So they should be economically indifferent to whether a customer is buying content from Netflix and Netflix is buying it from Viacom, or whether a customer is buying content from Comcast and Comcast is buying it from Viacom. It really doesn't make any difference. Comcast is not in the business of selling you video. They're in the business of transporting video on behalf of the, the media companies. And so I, I put that out there to say that I think it's, it's helpful to sort of reconstruct the argument. And, and in a way, it, this illustrates why it's so incredibly difficult for over the top to, to really make an impact in, uh, in, in the video business. You heard Netflix describe it um, as it is somehow intrinsically anti-competitive to charge for transport. Well, no, it isn't. It is simply that's the business they're in. They have an infrastructure that is there to provide transport, and they charge for it. The fact that they've buried that charge in the price of their video in the past doesn't mean that that, that, that is the only way to understand it. It simply means that's the way they've traditionally charged for it, um, but it doesn't mean they will charge for it that way in the future, and it is not intrinsically anti-competitive for them to simply make that charge explicit. So I'll end it there. Oh, this is just to say where we think returns are going. Um, the, cable, the cable industry is actually the only good business on this page. Um, and the reason it's a good business, uh, or the satellite business is a pretty good business too, but again, it's small under relative to the others. But the cable business is a good business. Um, and the reason it's a good business is because there isn't sufficient competition to make it a crappy business. Um, telecom businesses that have excessive competition tend to be crappy businesses. In the US, telecom in the US is a mostly crappy business. Um, and I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you. Now we know why uh, Simon Wilkie was feeling so dark and negative. And so our next, our next speaker uh, is uh, Lorenzo Pulpillo from uh, Telecom Italia. You have a presentation? Yes. yes. <clears throat> While we're looking for this, uh, get, anybody got one question for Craig? One question. It's got to be quick. Yeah. It's very quick. Uh, Netflix is actually an interesting case study because they've been both brick and mortar and online. In the brick and, mor in the brick and mortar space, they didn't charge for delivery. It was buried into the delivery of the CD. Uh, so somewhere, somehow, they're not recognizing that in their in their model according to what their representative said. Well, I, I think the challenge... the question for the web comment. Oh, so the, the question was just, you know, that, that in the old bricks and mortar model, Netflix buried transport costs through the postal service, essentially, in the cost of the subscription. Um, it, they do in the, in, the, uh, in the online model as well. The challenge for them is they don't control it, and it's not, there's no guarantee that it is postalized rates like in the world of postalized rates, the postal service. Um, and the challenge is Netflix now accounts for 30% of all the usage on the internet. If the service providers start to charge end users for incremental usage, then the effective cost to the end user rises to the point that the, that the, the utility equation becomes a whole lot less attractive. You know, right now, people tend to conceptualize it as, hey, wouldn't it be great if I could pay $8 for my video subscription and not pay 80. Well, that's not going to happen. There's no conceivable way that's going to happen. 
Um, that is partly, and the reason people misunderstand that is one, because they don't understand the transport function as an explicit function. And then second, they don't understand that the content companies have no vested interest in replacing what for them is a $30 a month model with an $8 model. I mean, it's, it's not going to work on either of those, of, of those bases. So you know, I still tend to be extremely bearish about the prospects of, of Netflix as a business. Okay, uh, we okay. figured out. Yes. Um, okay, after the presentation of uh, Greg, I think probably we should uh, change job. I don't know because the you know the perspective looks really difficult. But what I would like to do is. Uh, seems to support your position. Eh? Seems <laughs> to support your position. I was joking. No, no. Yeah. no I'm saying that. Uh, <laughs> Probably what we should do, uh, you know, what I want to do today is uh, uh, briefly uh, suggest a you know, um, way out you know, that uh, uh, has been also uh, previously mentioned in some uh, uh, intervention, the idea of uh, uh, having a win-win uh, uh, solution with OTT through offering of quality of services. Um, let's uh, start. Uh, um, from this graph. Okay, here I think that uh, you know it has been uh, said before. For instance, even from uh, from um, Ambassador Gross, you know that uh, uh, this issue of sustainability is very uh, old. I don't think that is true. In other words, uh, probably was thinking about uh, uh, technical sustainability of the of the network, not economic sustainability. This graph tells you something. Uh, very clear. In other words, uh, in the world of voice, uh, was it clear that there was, uh, um, you know, a positive difference between cost and and, uh, and revenue. In other words, the revenue were able to cover the cost. Now, in the in the in the data domain, instead, there is this phenomenon of uh, exponential growth of um, of traffic. So huge uh, growth of cost uh, of um, CAPEX uh, and OPEX for telecom operator. And on the other side, uh, the revenue are flat. And this is something that we should, uh, uh, this is the real issue of sustainability. No, there was flat, uh, because as I will say also later on, on the, on the um, uh, end user consuming, you know, they, they have a flat rate and they are consumer are used to, to have a um, declining uh, access rate, uh, not only in, uh, in um, uh, real terms, but even in nominal terms. Okay. On the other side, as I will say, there is this market of uh, IP interconnection. All say that it's very peculiar. To some extent, uh, it's uh, also uh, characterized by this growing uh, of traffic, growing of cost, but uh, the, the rate are very, very low. And so there is this issue. If you look on the on the on um, on the right chart here, you see that, for instance, telecom operator. We compare telecom operator with TT. Telecom operator uh, are very good in uh, on um, generating cash flow, uh, EBITDA minus capex of revenue. Okay, these are all the major telecom operator. Uh, but in terms of growth, uh, the situation does look very promising. Okay, instead there uh, are like the TT level. Uh, a better performance, especially uh, in um, potential uh, revenue, revenue growth. Uh, so what you have to do, if on the end user side the situation is pretty um, defined, in other words, that uh, there is no possibility really to, to uh, increase you know, the revenue from the end user, uh, I think we should uh, look at uh, this uh, IP interconnection market. And what I want to do here very briefly, is, okay, this, well, I, I, I just give some figure on this issue of sustainability, okay? Uh, what I want to do basically is to go very briefly, dynamically, on what's happening in this IP interconnection period. This is how, how this started. In 1995, NSNet closed down and gave a speed tier one and tier one. At that time, the traffic was 0 0.18 pegabyte. Uh, petabyte per month, okay? Uh, so there were transit and uh, and peering relations, and overall the system at the beginning was uh, was working. Later on, there is an explosion of traffic, and 
Uh, you know, here comes the OTT phenomenon. Uh, 2004, Google was a decent stock market. Same, the traffic starts to, to grow dramatically. We are reaching 2004, um, 1,477 uh, petabytes per month. But what, what we, we are seeing here also, uh, you know, we see this, uh, this uh, phenomenon that we call you know, the, the free ride. In other words, there are this traffic from OTT is not requested by telco operator BNA. A, a, you know, goes uh, through this uh, network, and uh, this network is now the traffic that the, the OTT generating flows through transit that are paid by telcos operator or through peering that free of charge. Um, and so this creates this problem of sustainability on the IP interconnection side. Um, then, later on, 2010, we start to have this uh, phenomenon of uh, uh, companies like uh, Akamai start to, uh, to uh, collocate some of these uh, uh, caching uh, techniques, CDN, and to, uh, to try to capitalize on, uh, on a uh, better uh, uh, management of the traffic of flow. And this is the an interesting signal that there is a starting, starting a demand for quality of services from, uh, from the operator. Um, if we look at, so this is the basic idea. Uh, there was this also from, from the, uh, who is going to pay for, uh, for this. Uh, we, we should look at exactly at the IP interconnection to set the market, okay? And uh, uh, so the problem is, uh, the little to side market is quite complex, but the basic idea is that we should try to, to allocate cost and revenue in such a way that it's an incentive for both part of, uh, to participate in the business. So, for instance, uh, Professor Yu from Walton School is suggesting that uh, uh, when there is this imbalance in the two sides market, um, uh, between there is this, uh, this asymmetry in cost and revenue between uh, the two sides of the, of the market, uh, there, there should be uh, a, a side payment to some extent from the, um, the side that uh, has a, a higher revenue and lower cost on the other side. Of course, this is a special situation. In some other cases, there can be another flow of, uh, of, um, uh, of revenue. But this is important to say that uh, we should try to strike a win-win uh, uh, solution on this uh, on this map. And uh, what uh, what we basically see this is an opportunity to develop quality of services uh, offering that will allow uh, OTT to grow the reach of customers. Okay, and for us, for telecom to be able to make more revenue out of the offering of point of service. Because we call not point of service, we have a limited and user market, no telco compensation for network use, traffic growth quality of, uh, um, of, of uh, degradation of um, point of experience, OTT is a business narrow by limited network growth. Instead, with quality of service, to some extent, there is an enlargement of the market. This should, uh, should uh, so there is uh, um, the possibility of, of expanding the number of uh, the reach for, uh, for, um, for the OTT. At the same time, we can uh, make more viable our business. Uh, the idea is, uh, but why the, the OTT should pay for quality of services? There is a market for that. Well, uh, definitely, uh, quality of service as value. If you, uh, if you think about, for instance, what Big is saying, uh, that uh, two seconds of the day uh, will create, will uh, imply, imply a 4.3 reduction in revenue per client. Google consider 400 milliseconds of delay as a reduction 0.6 of search on the web. Uh, Aberdeen Group, they have quantified you know, what is the one second loss in responding to a request. Basically means uh, minus 16% of client satisfaction, uh, uh, reduction in business page of 11%. It, the, the chart down here shows what is the improvement, for instance, with services like uh, Akamai are using for web acceleration. Okay. 
Um, how big is this market? Using some data from, from Cisco, this is the, the most uh, updated data, we think that uh, uh, if we consider uh, the, the whole, uh, for example, for 2012, if we consider the overall video market, I think at least 50% of this market can be addressed with uh, quality of services uh, type of offering. And probably the telecom operator can get about 10 15 percent out of that. Uh, furthermore, this is something extremely important. It's related to what also Netflix was saying before. We are getting uh, calls, you know, continuous from, uh, from Google, from Akamai, other company. They want, uh, at the moment, they reach uh, you know, at the interconnection point outside our network. They want to move uh, their server within our network to give a better point to their customer. Okay, this is something that we can do, this is the idea. Uh, we think the overall there is a business case for us to do this better in a cheaper way and at the same time for the for the OTT to have a better reach and serve to their customers. So overall uh, the idea to approach this, uh, this um, problem of the sustainability will be in a win-win perspective by means of new commercial agreement to end the end end-to-end quality of services, improve the internet environment both for OTT and users, better user market, improve performance, uh, and increase because uh, we enlarge the market for OTT and telcos will get additional revenue of guarantees and delivery. Thank you very much. And our high speaker today, Francois Borrell from uh, Germany, EDOT, who's he's not talking about he's uh, really an entrepreneur, a reformed entrepreneur. Okay. So let's see if I can get this done. Is uh, anybody have a question for Lorenzo? Just while I'm trying to do this, do to make quick quick questions. Lorenzo, um, the Professor Yu uh, formula that, uh, that you seem to agree with, um, how does one control for inefficiency on the side of the equation that is having higher costs with lower revenue? Simply control for inefficiency of the operation on that side. Can you repeat the question? Well, I... Look, look, oh, no, no, and you, uh, you see, I don't know the, uh, the detail how this can be work out. The basic message is that, you know, because at 2 sides market, you have to find a, a solution that takes into account uh, you cannot uh, maximize the profit of each uh, single, uh, uh, like it was uh, a one-side market only. And so this idea of, uh, of taking into account the, over the two sides is the, the way to go to some extent. But this is important, you know, he stressed this, by the way, this uh, is a new book from the series coming, uh, I think, next week. Uh, out in the library, uh, I found very interesting for many reasons, but he was saying that the idea is that uh, there should be, in other words, regulation should allow flexibility to allow this uh, combination of different flow, okay, from one side to the other, okay? Francois, well. thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'd like first to thank Elia and Bob because I think, uh, well, very, diversify Prisma of ideas, and uh, guess what? I feel even more uh, disturbed by what I've heard. I thought it was very, very complex, now I think it's very, very complex. Uh, but the good news in France, we always are late, uh, but we always finish in time. So I try to be... Uh, um, what I'd like to do is to share um, my vision uh, with three hats. First, as the chairman of IDAT, by the way, we are not uh, calling this IDAT anymore because IDATE means uh, in the US, you know, kind of dating on the internet. So we're going to be the digital institute by IDAT. Um, then I will have a, a hat of operator. I'm an operator. I used to run big operators and with some friends we create an operator, which is free um, in Belgium. And last, as an investor, because I invest in telco and, and OTT. First of all, uh, other IDA, uh, Digital Institute, we, we look at what's going on. I'd like to share with you an experience I had 
in 2007, I was at the board of British Telecom, and I came to the board um, with the evolution of our industry. One slide I really love, by the way, is from our AT&T colleagues who summarize uh, the evolution of our, our business. One phone, one technology, one company, no customer users, to a system with trillions of dollars in 25 years. It has been outstanding. What I did, in fact, is um, I put all the stack of our ecosystem, equipment, telco, operators, application, OTT, and look at the evolution of the last 10 years of market cap, revenue, market share, EBITDA. Uh, and then I did a projection from 2007 to 2012. So guess what? I was not that bad. Except one thing is the rich get richer and the poor gets poorer. So the big issue we have in our industry is how the wealth is distributed. When you look at the internet, it has been created on a sporadic basis, on a ad hoc basis, without any governance. And what we forgot is to discriminate the packet, the packet of information. So in other words, if you make a $10 million profit from a transaction, or if you have a a Skype uh, and the voice is a packet, of course, or you just ask, uh, try and schedule, the packet is not discriminated. And some very smart kids uh, in the Valley has disrupt traditional business like peer-to-peer -peer business, eBay, advertising, or uh, phones and whatever, and create a fantastic business using a network that they've never financed. Everything was legal and genius, and it has created a huge uh, revolution. And I can tell you, being a European, it has been a big failure, and we, I've shared this many times with politicians and commissioners, that we didn't take in Europe a piece of the cake. Most of the value has been created in the US. Most of the companies are in the US. Uh, the tax are paid in the US. Uh, the VAT and the job, and it's very centralized. So uh, I think it's a very good, uh, it's a fantastic uh, uh, success in my view. The only uh, area where I think the value has been well distributed into the enterprise business. We always talk about consumer, but I used to run a big operator in enterprise, and when you look at the packet of data, you have three ways to discriminate it, and, and then to, uh, to, to have the customer pay for it. First, uh, you have uh, the, uh, the bandwidth, and it was very interesting to see how Swisscom now has implemented an enterprise model into a consumer. Then you have a quality of services. Somebody talked about end-to-end. Uh, -end. It's clear when you are a trader in Shanghai and dealing on, on the New York Stock Exchange, you need to have a millisecond response time end-to-end. -end. And then you have the service level agreement, which is very important, uh, which is kind of uh, the downtime and everything like that. So the same packet can worth one, ten, or hundred. That's why the enterprise business in, tele in telecom is, is quite, quite okay. And the VPNs, um, which has been developed all over the place, has allowed the operators to make reasonable money, artificially discriminating um, uh, the, uh, the packet uh, of data. But at the, at the end of the day, uh, it's quite, I think it's quite scary. Uh, our Chinese colleagues say, when uh, the rich get a call, the poor die. And here is the difference. Uh, when the poor have a call, the rich will die. The big difference between 25 years ago is now we are in an ecosystem. So try, trying to solve this issue is, is a kind of nightmare. I remember last year we had the EG8 and President Sarkozy came talking about tax. Uh, some others we need to uh, pay fees or cap and whatever. I don't think it's the right solution in my view. But so far, I have not find a solution. So I think that's why we need to put all the brains uh, together to find a solution. Now I'd like to take a few minutes my operators had, and this is scary. I can tell you in my position of chairman of IDAT, and I have a lot of friends as operator, and all the record, many of them tell me I don't know what to do. When I'm a fixed operator, I need to deal with the debts, I need to deal with the dividends, I need to deal with the pension. Some operators, uh, they pension funds four times the market cap of the company. I need to invest in fiber. 
well, ID to keep the people because I cannot find them because they are under uh, contract. And it's very difficult because every day they lose customers. Every day the kids who grew up in a free and freedom environment don't you know, use the traditional for the cash code uh, of the operator and that they, everything is free. You know? um, when I talk to my friends who are in a, a mobile business, except few of them, like Swisscom or Free in France, was uh, done on a marketing basis what LT will offer, and I think the US is far in advance with, with Germany, they try to postpone, you know, they're going to war. Trying, they try to change you know, the business model that has been uh, said by the Secretary General, where you pay minutes and location uh, and time into a web-based, uh, internet-based type of model. And nobody knows how to do this. Some have invested in contents, some have invested into uh, mobile banking or geolocalizations or group on bits and whatever. But we are nowhere near to finance a, the transformation into the 4G, and to satisfy uh, the, 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 uh, the shareholders. By the way, I'm not giving names because we have a very good analyst in our, in our but I can tell you, except those who are protected by the government, uh, in few countries the regulation is not uh, that strong, most of them are in a scary position. Needless to say, by the way, that as Eve said, we are in recession in Europe, and at some point of time, we'll have to merge and mix many uh, of the operators. So as an operator, to be honest, I'm scared. <laughs> now, as an investor, I'm mixed, I'm mixed. On my right part of my brain, I'm very excited. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur, I've created uh, a few companies, and I'm still uh, created lots, co lots of companies. And I think the OTT has been a fantastic opportunity to big business without financing uh, the infrastructure. It's viral, it's outside boundaries, you can play with stacks, you don't need to employ people in a hostile uh, environment. And one of my company is an operator and, and an OTT. And in three months, we've done more revenue and margin than in three years as an operator. So we're very excited. But on my left part of the brain, which is my rational part, every time I feel I'm making money on OTT. I don't feel bad. I feel bad with my left part because I say this is a profit I'm making, which will not be rejected uh, into the uh, 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 the infrastructure. And that, that the big issue uh, in our industry. And now, if I have to do a projection in the next three years, I think the rich get even richer because there will be a lot of new OTT popping up. You know when. Uh, the knowledge is distributed, aggregated on a random basis. You will have plenty of smart kids which find great ideas. And at the same time, I think the ones which are at the bottom of the Maslow pyramid will have a lot of problems because they will, not, they will have lots of issues to refinance their debt and also to uh, reinvest. So what to do? Uh, it, will, it would have been great if we could have found the solution, Eli will be written famous in, a, in eight hours. But I think, for me, now as a citizen, as an entrepreneur, as an operator, and as the chairman of this institute, um, in the US you have lots of charity. Um, we have lots of companies who have the green index. And I think we could think about creating an index for the OTT who contribute to the infrastructure. Because at some point, this is the only way I see to keep our industry uh, coming, uh, but I'm full of hope, so I'm sure the brains together will find a solution to make our um, uh, community sustainable for the foreseeing future. Thank you very much. All right, we have time for some questions, and I think there's, <laughs> I don't know, I'm depressed, I'm gonna need a drink after this. Um, so let's have, uh, Robert Pepper, and then Brian Seven, and Raul Katz. Yeah. Good, friends. Well, uh, your, your statement, there were two things that you said. One, did I hear you correctly that said that, when you said that the, the companies that have been protected by, by their governments and therefore have postponed facing up to this transformation are actually much worse off? No, uh, I'm, I'm not going to mention countries, but 
few countries in Europe, the government has still big shareholders, um, and the uh, regulator under the uh, responsibility. So there is no push to open, and the dividends and the revenue are protected. Okay, so, so, so every country where it's open, uh, they face uh, uh, regulation, of course, but they face competition, and here it's very difficult uh, for them because the system has not been built to share the value uh, created you know, over the top. So the, then, thank you for clarification. The, the second question, though, is, um, and this has been underlying a lot of the conversation during the day, and I still don't have a good feel for it, and that is, is there a fundamental difference between the service providers in Europe and the at least AT&T and Verizon, which we've heard from today, um, it appears that AT&T and Verizon have begun to make the shift. If you take a look, actually, at the numbers that both you know Jackie talked about and um, uh, Len talked about with declining voice revenue, and they're saying, and if you look at their financials and everything built around that, and the earnings calls, they say, yeah, that's just those just minutes of voice. Take a look, we're, you know, our revenue, our margins are up based on mobile, based on data, based upon the new business model. Is that real or not in your mind? And, yeah, I, I think. And, and why is it then that the U.S. operators have been able to do that, but the European operators haven't seemed yes. to be able to do that? I think two reasons. First of all, you don't have you have two or four operators in the U.S. Uh, I, I I used to be part of a company called Ascent Communication. I went one of the four guys, and we've built, you know, all the sites, Silex, Silex, you know, uh, in the U.S. Now you have two or four operators. Second, I think U.S. has been always ahead of the game. I remember going to the uh, Silicon Valley uh, hotel, and for the first time, if I type, if, if I took a 24 hours Wi-Fi, I had free voice, and for me it was incredible. And I think. U.S. has been always in advance, very creatively, and I think what they, what U.S. has done on LT, uh, on all the new uh, uh, package offering, at what Europe will have to do. Few countries have done that, but uh, in Europe, how many operators we have? If hundred, mobile yes, people. For, yes, for for fix or for wireless. Uh, mobile. Mobile, three, four, four. Five, six, seven, 20, seven. Twenty-seven country and yeah. at least three. Uh, yeah. Of yeah. Yeah. And because the, we don't co-locate that much except you know, France Telecom and, and Dutch Telecom, we have a big issue to fund the next generation, either it, it's 4G or LTE, or either it's fiber and whatever. It's, a, it's an industry uh, issue. Yeah. So to what, to what extent is that because of the lack of single market across country, right? Because the, We don't have a single market. I know. Yeah. That's, I, I, I would say this. Look, you know, just thinking about the the, the U.S. And, and globally, you know, there's a tendency for us all as telecom people to lose the forest for the trees a little bit and to get lost in the well. Uh, you were you, what you were citing for Verizon. Well, voice is going down, but this is going up, and that's going down. And, and Verizon and AT&T always report their strategic services and they count, you know, things that are growing are strategic and things that aren't growing are no longer strategic. And, um, and so, you know, they, you always have lots of stuff that you can find in any business that's growing. If you step back and, 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 and sort of try to see the forest for the trees, at the end of the day, what these companies are is they're trying to charge customers money for transport, right? Regardless of whether, and, and if it's all bits and bytes. So in a sense, they're just trying to say, are we generating enough revenue from transport to cover the cost of the infrastructure. And the reality is in the US they are barely doing it. In most of Europe they are no longer doing it. Um, no one other than Verizon and AT&T in the US is coming close to doing it. And in aggregate the industry is not doing it. So, and, and we're at the what, what is arguably the best possible moment in the US and it's still barely squeaking by and getting worse. Uh, to me there's only one variable that matters and that is how many operators are there in the market. Everything else is noise. It's at the end of the day, it's in markets that are highly concentrated, you can earn a reasonable return. In markets that aren't highly concentrated, you can't. Well, end of story. Everything else is noise. Brian. Yeah, uh, let me follow up on that. Great. Uh, first, uh, just a quick clarification. Are you including the dividends of AT&T and Verizon in the cost of capital? No, no, no. The, the, the cost of capital is simply a function of the weighted average cost of your equity and your debt. So whether, how, whether you choose to pay it out in dividends or don't doesn't make any difference. Okay. 
Okay. So, so what does AT and T and Verizon do? Do they try to go up the food chain and merge with uh, uh, cable companies and uh, satellite companies? Well, it, it, from a regulatory yeah. perspective, a cable company and a, and a telephone company really couldn't merge on the wireline side of the business. And the wireless side of the business is earning a passable return, not a great one, but a passable return. The wireline side is losing money now. Um, and the challenge is, from a regulatory perspective, you probably can't just jettison the wireline business and pretend it doesn't exist. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, the challenge is try to shift the mix to a growing business. The problem is as you shift the mix to the growing business, the wireless business is kind of not growing anymore either. So, um, look, it's, it's a really tough situation. I, I, I suspect that it, it's easy to imagine that AT&T, for example, will go X growth within a year or so. Um, even on the wireless side of the business, it won't be enough to prop up the whole business. And then what does it do? It can look overseas and things like that, but it's, it's really hard. Uh, well, the last time, uh, for Craig, the last time I looked at um, uh, the, whether they are earning a cost of capital was in 2002, and, and, and as expected, they were underwater then. Um, uh, let me take a little bit of, I wouldn't say nuance, maybe a nuanced view relative to the one we're talking about. How about if we want to go actually in a cyclical kind of way, and, uh, and there are situations where these things could uh, move in a, in, a, in a better kind of zone than they are, particularly for the US players, because on the other ones, on some of the European ones, we have to recognize that California is clearly underwater in Spain and Europe, but they are doing wonderful in Brazil, so that is um, helping them cross-subsidize cross the whole question, portfolio. Questions. But the question is, then, it, uh, which is interesting, we, have, we haven't actually touched on the fact that there's a massive overvaluation, overvaluation of assets on the OTT side. Because we start touching on some of the firms, I mean, notwithstanding the fact that Google controls 95% of the search market, the rest of the people, and I, I, I haven't done whether they are underwater, but if I look at their valuations, they're completely overblown. So structurally, we have on one side the telcos that have these kind of situations that you outlined. On the other hand, the OTTs are uh, in a bubble kind of a situation. Yeah, I, look, I would, I, I would agree with that. I, I think the key thing to remember, though, look, is, is what, what OTT is, there's lots of different arguments about you know, OTT as what I would really like to have is more choice, I would really like to have, think about it, OTT in video, right? More choice anywhere I want on any device. OTT in, in telecom is, um, is, is voice agnostic and location agnostic and number portability and that sort of stuff. But that's all stuff around the edges and it's really kind of minor. What OTT really is is price arbitrage. That's all it really is. And when you take a system that's not earning its cost of capital and you say, let's, I've got an idea, let's see if we can lower the prices, well, that's not going to work, right? That's, at the end of the day, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about taking a system that's not earning its cost of capital and seeing if we can find a way to lower the prices even more. <clears throat> yeah, but, but you, 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 you always separated uh, a mobile and fixed as a separate business, you know. But if you are an integrated company, there, there is no separate model, only the last mile is mobile, you know, and we heard a couple of times Absolutely. that if, if you create synergies, you need a fixed for a network, you know, to bring the traffic as early as possible in the ground. So I think you, you can't just give up your fixed network. No, so, you're right, you're exactly right. I, I, I would totally agree with that. That's why I think... And, and you can create synergies, you know, and the other thing is that you can found the LTE development. But, but I wait, think, when, you, when you add them together, it gets worse instead of better. Right? Yeah, and the LTE development in Germany, the only one neck are frequencies, you know, and if, if the, the regulators give up frequency, also the equipment costs are coming down, you know, uh, we, uh, to the uh, Alcatel and others are suffering under it, you know, but uh, the equipment for LTE is much more effective and less costly than the old technology was. You, you have to take this into account. I, I do, um, and the problem is the price, uh, like, think about the price, right? I mean, the, the, today on a blended average base, or I did this work in 2010, so I'll use the old number. On a blended average basis, the U.S. was generating um, about two cents, or sorry, about uh, 43 cents per megabyte. Uh, by the end of 2015, it looks like it'll be generating about two, right? So, um, so you have a, an enormous deflation. The cost of equipment is coming down very rapidly, but not quite as rapidly as that. So the business gets worse instead of better, right? It doesn't get radically worse, but you can also think about it as going from, from 3G to 4G is something like a three times improvement in productivity of the network. Um, that's, that buys, that's a once every 10 year upgrade. 
and the traffic on the network is doubling every two years or every year. So it buys you about 18 months of incremental capacity every 10 years. Right. Quick questions, because now we're going to be really quick. A lot of hands in about eight minutes. Um, one of the things, though, could, couldn't we be setting up sort of a, a, a situation where the semi-strong players like the Amazons, the Microsofts, are essentially waiting for the telecom industry to collapse, given given the figures you're talking about. That, that how are you going to keep up no, with, with sort so. of earnings? I, I think what the what the, the I, I think companies like Google and Amazon are unwittingly causing the collapse, but I don't think that's intentional. I think they are doing what any net rational um, capitalist would do, and that's trying to find economics where they can find economics. The problem is the structure requires. You know, the, the, the whole net neutrality debate, um, which is a fascinating debate and is couched in lots of First Amendment terms, is largely about the protection of the self-interest to try to preserve free rider status, right? That's what it is. It's perfectly rational that you would do oh, that because, um, <laughs> because, because, you know, the self-interest of the companies who are doing it is, is, is over here. The self-interest of the companies the carriers is over here, and they're trying to they try to make a different argument. There is no right and wrong in the argument. They're simply companies in a capitalist market are trying to, to capture the economics of the system for themselves. That's what you're supposed to do. The problem is we as a society want incremental infrastructure investment um, in a business at a time when earnings growth and popular uh, sorry uh, income growth and population growth is not sufficiently rapid in our country to support growth in, in the infrastructure, and yet we want more infrastructure, right? Well, what do you do? It's a real problem. Okay, we got, we'll got. we we'll do a quick question. Yeah, putting aside, there's so much to response to, including the fact that the OTT sector is not just three, four big companies, it's zillions of companies, it's zillions of nonprofits, it has all kinds of other things going on, the spillover effects, et cetera. My main question is, okay, what do we do about it, right? There seem to be two answers. One is bilateral agreements between a carrier you know, and, and, and folks in the industry. I know that the Carney report came out two years ago, right? And that was touted by pretty much every European carrier I could think of. Every time they came over to visit our offices and other people's offices, all they wanted to do was, let's have, a, let's have an agreement. Let's do something commercially. And we talked about various things. We would build more fiber in the network. We'd build CDNs. But at the end of the day, we said, we don't see the value for us, so we declined it. Well, the only other answer seems to be government intervention. And so I, my question is, I guess, is the Edno proposal ultimately saying, we couldn't do this thing commercially, therefore the only way that's left to us is in fact a mandate from the ITU that every every regulatory body around the world is supposed to start charging the content guys. First one, you have, two, you, you have two options here. Either you replicate what happened in finance, Lehman collapse, system collapse, everybody knew it will collapse and we wait for one. So once you will have a big one will collapse, then the society. The second thing is, uh, we we uh, we uh, we suffering is the lack of interest of the politicians on the digital agenda. Uh, uh, in the French uh, election, there is no discussion about the digital agenda. The two previous ministers in France, in charge of uh, digital agenda, whatever, both of them told me, "Oh, I can't wait to have a real job." So, uh, so the digital agenda has never been considered as important. So in Europe, as an example, where you have 27 countries, very few, except the UK, where, in my view, of course, did a very good job uh, with the government, there is no uh, agenda. So it's like we know there is an issue, but we, 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 don't, we don't want to hear about that, because there is trillions of dollars at stake. Uh, and if tomorrow uh, one operator say, you know, I'm going to cut you know, my profit by 50% and dividends, because I need to reinvest, uh, so the shareholder will say, so what? So that, that's a critical aspect of the issue. Lorenzo, last word, and then Ellen, no, no, it's a word. To Rick. Uh, well, uh, as I mentioned before, I think that this idea of bilateral agreement based on COVID itself can be one way that can help. You know, on the Edison side, we are not asking again for, for regulation. We want to just create the best enabling environment that they will allow that. They will, because there are countries that, are, that won't uh, uh, impede the, the development of quite of service, that it is insane because it will be really a world of, of uh, evolving sustainability of the internet. We are trying to uh, 
to, diciamo, per tu sei to create, uh, in other words, it's not a uh, help, it's not a regulation, it's just to say create a situation in which this, thing, this agreement can be done, okay, overall. Because, you know, for instance, uh, for, uh, um, one of the reasons, one of the reasons for which I think, you know, like the US and the Europe are in different situations, for instance, we have, uh, as, as uh, I'm sure that AT&T Verizon have with Google different type of agreement than what we have, because of the size, they have different market power to some extent to negotiate what they do. Uh, for, to do that in Europe, we need to have in each country a uh, similar condition. For this reason, we are asking for this enabling environment. So, okay, I'm afraid okay. we got to end. Elliot's got to think. Just a second. Just a second. Just a second. Oh, I got to tell you where the drinks are. Okay, uh, first, so quick, we had 30 plus speakers. Great. It re was really good. I thought, I thought it was really, really good. <laughs> Before we think, okay. it, in a way, what I heard, and there were lots of things going, going, going on, and certainly we did not even get close to resolving this so we can move to what I really was starting this morning, which is the next generation. Now, uh, but there was a lot of kind of, of pushback here among the Americans uh, on, the, on a solution. Uh, and now in that last panel, we actually kind of came back to the problem. We have not solved it, but I think we're kind of now acknowledging more as we hear that there is a fundamental issue at stake. Uh, and in some ways it kind of harks back to things that we did at CITI years back, which is fundamental economic issues in this kind of network industry. And I think they're working themselves out. So now that we have rejected the solution, accepted the problem, in some ways, it's too bad we don't have another day, or maybe it's good actually that we don't, but that to think about kind of, if that is not the solution, but we accept the problem, what is the proper solution? And so maybe that would be something that we can take from here and kind of work this out in some fashion. Now, um, since everybody has, is, kind of, is certainly tired and that's what we can now, I want to say, first I want to thank you very much. We had an eye date. <laughs> All right. uh, with Eve and with Francois and with their collaborators. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, we, we enjoyed the collaboration. <laughs>